Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. I'm Chucky2009, and you're watching part one of my Teach Yourself How to Tube Weld Aluminum Series. Now, this series is designed to take someone with little to no prior welding experience, you know, be it TIG welding or working with aluminum or, or both through some of the fundamentals of welding aluminum. We're going to talk a little bit about the metal and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background knowledge that will help you weld it. And then we're pretty much just going to start welding. And I've got this inverter tin machine here and we're going to talk about machine setup and we're going to get the welder all dialed in and then we're going to start slow. I got some of these little aluminum coupons. We're going to start off just running some pads and beads on these and uh, start there and work up through some various types of weld joints and hopefully by the end of the series you'll go from how the heck do you weld aluminum to look at the various joint configurations of aluminum I can weld. I understand what's going on now. Now there's a chance you may have heard people tell you that working with aluminum, you know, especially TIG welding it is one of the hardest things you can do welding wise and it's, it's really confusing and it takes like decades of practice to be able to do anything. And, uh, you know, before we start the series, I'd just like to say that that's kind of what I heard too. And my opinion on this is that welding aluminum isn't really harder than welding other metals, but it's certainly different. And if your background is just in welding steel and you move over to aluminum and you expect the same things to work and you expect to, the, the puddle to look and feel the same and everything to be just carried directly over, well, I think that's where a lot of people run into problems. Like I said, welding aluminum, Mainly it's just different and let's talk about some of those differences. Now one of the most widely known differences between welding aluminum and other metals is that when you TIG weld aluminum, you almost always use AC current. Now the main reason that AC or alternating current is commonly used to TIG weld aluminum is that aluminum, while it doesn't rust per se like, you know, steel and iron do, it still forms a very hard oxide coating. Now the thing about aluminum oxide is it's really, really hard stuff. In fact, at a hardness scale, it'd be relatively close to diamonds, believe it or not. And not only is it really hard, it has a very, very high melting point. Your average piece of aluminum is going to start to melt somewhere around 1200 degrees and the coating of aluminum oxide on that aluminum isn't going to melt until about 3700. So needless to say, it can cause some problems when you weld it. If you don't remove this coating of aluminum oxide, what happens is the aluminum underneath starts to melt and then the oxide coating on top stays solid and it breaks into chunks and then they're floating around in your weld puddle and they make your finished weld brittle and it's a really bad time. So as mentioned, you're really going to want to do everything you can to fight this aluminum oxide. Now where am I going with this? Well, you'll see in a minute. Not only is this aluminum oxide coating really hard, it's also really thin. In fact, your average coating of aluminum oxide on a generic piece of aluminum is probably only going to be a few thousandths of an inch thick, and that's something you can break up with just a plain old stainless steel wire brush. Now, not only do we have the wire brush on our side, we also have our good friend, alternating current. Now, as the name implies, alternating current means that the current switches between positive, or in our case, electrode positive, and electrode negative, somewhere between, with this machine, depending on where you set this, we'll talk about this later, uh, 20 times and 250 times per second. And where I'm going with this is that when the piece of aluminum you're welding is negatively charged, it's bombarded by positive ions, which work to break up tiny little bits of loose, broken up oxides. Now, why is this otherwise really hard coating of aluminum oxides just in little loose particles that can be basically zapped by the cathodic bombardment process? Well, because prior to welding, we beat the crap out of them with the stainless steel wire brush. And that's why AC, or alternating current, is commonly used to TIG weld aluminum, and that's of course what we're going to be doing in this series. Now, you may have heard that you can weld aluminum with DC or direct current, electronegative, which you can, but the thing is, because you don't have this alternating current related cleaning action, there's not really as much you can do about this layer of oxide. And the other thing is, DC TIG welding of aluminum is commonly done with helium gas, which costs a lot more than argon. The other thing worth pointing out here is that argon is a heavy gas. It sinks, it displaces oxygen, whereas helium, as we know, you know, it's like the same helium they put in balloons, it rises. So when you got your welding torch, argon stays generally around the weld puddle, but helium wants to keep going up, and because of that, you have to run a much, much higher flow rate of this astronomically expensive gas. And that, coupled with the lack of cleaning action, is why I recommend that if you want to get into TIG welding aluminum, you find an AC-capable TIG machine. Also worth noting is the fact that aluminum is a really, really good conductor of, among other things, heat and electricity. I want to say it conducts heat 
I believe about six times faster than steel and it conducts electricity much better as well. And uh, two things here. First and foremost, this is why if you've ever researched a welder, you'll hear people say that, you know, this machine is capable of 3 16 inch steel, but only eighth inch aluminum. Well, that's why. Also, aluminum acts as a heat sink sometimes. Well, pretty much every time it's aluminum, that's what it does. Which means that if we're welding in the middle of this piece, the heat is gonna get sucked away from where we're welding out to you know the rest of the piece much faster than it would with steel or a number of other metals. And that's why you commonly use a few more amps when you're welding eighth inch aluminum than when you're welding, I don't know, eighth inch steel. And now that we've got that out of the way, let's get some aluminum cleaned up and ready to weld. All right, so we're gonna clean some aluminum and there's two things that we have to worry about. The first is the oxide coating that we talked about earlier and the second is things that might be embedded in or stuck to that oxide coating. The thing about aluminum oxide is not only is it really hard, it's also surprisingly porous. This stuff really is kind of a pain to deal with. And I know, not many, when you think of something hard like steel or concrete or whatever, it's probably not that porous, right? Well, aluminum oxide kind of is. And things like grease, oil, water, moisture, etc. like to stick in that. So before we hit this with our stainless steel wire brush, we're going to go ahead and wipe it down with some acetone. Now a couple things here worth mentioning. First and foremost, as you can see, I'm wearing these bluish, greenish, I believe they're called neoprene gloves, and these things are freaking amazing. I bought a huge box of these for like 10 bucks or something on eBay, and now I don't, anytime I spray paint something or use acetone or change oil and something, I don't get that crap all over my hands. I don't have to scrub my hands. I, I don't get acetone like going into my skin, and that's always a good thing. So if you're gonna be doing welding type stuff or really anything, well, I don't know, I got a big box of these. I think it's probably one of the best investments I ever made. So there's that. Also, we're gonna be using acetone because acetone is what a lot of people really like because it commonly leaves little to no residue on the piece of aluminum itself. But whatever you do, do not use brake cleaner because there's something in common brake cleaner that when an arc hits it, it produces, I believe, phosgene gas is what it's called. And, uh, and it, it kills you like almost instantly. So it's really serious stuff, but uh, yeah, don't get yourself killed by using brake cleaner. All right, now, when I clean aluminum, I like to use acetone first before I wire brush it, simply because this way we're removing stuff without actually brushing it into the material like it would be, uh, you know, afterwards. But I know a lot of people have different opinions and preferences on that. Now it's worth noting that you, you want to be careful not to wipe around anything that's on this aluminum. Uh, however, luckily for me, this hasn't been sitting out. It's outside, you know, in the rain and weather for years, so it's pretty clean stuff. It's just the aluminum we're welding was a, uh, was a remnant I picked up from the local steel yard. So we don't really have too much to worry about. But regardless, I'll just go ahead and wipe it down with this acetone. And then we're going to wire brush it. When we talk about wire brushing aluminum, as mentioned, we're using a stainless steel wire brush. This is important because not only does it have to be stainless steel, but it has to have never been used on carbon steel or cast iron or anything like that, because if it, if it has been, then, uh, then it can contaminate your weld. Now you'll know that the aluminum is brushed enough to weld when it looks like the piece on the left. The piece on the right is just plain old aluminum that I haven't yet touched with the wire brush. And that's what I'm going to do next. Brushed aluminum looks like, well, brushed aluminum. Unbrushed aluminum is kind of shiny. In fact, I think I can see myself talking right now. <laughs> that's kind of cool. And so I'll just set this down and go ahead and hit this with the old stainless steel wire brush. Now you might want to notice I've actually gone ahead and set a couple other pieces of aluminum down. This way I'm not missing quote unquote with the wire brush and hitting my carbon steel table. All right, now you get bonus points if you use a lint-free cloth, just like I'm not. And what's optional, but something I kind of like to do just for a little bit of added peace of mind, is take a clean part of the rag and use it to just wipe off some of the loose, broken up oxides. And this piece is ready to weld. Now, as mentioned, you don't have to do the entire piece. You pretty much just have to do where you're welding and then immediately around it. You know, if you've got like a four by eight sheet, you don't have to brush the entire thing. Just, uh, just where you're gonna be working with it. So, all right, let's talk about machine settings. This, as mentioned, is our amperage control, and the way I would describe amperage to someone who's new to welding is it's, it's basically how much power you're using. It's basically how much power you're putting into the weld. You know, more amperage generates more heat and uh, melts a lot more metal. So, you know, the thicker the material, the more amperage you're gonna be using. This over here is what's referred to as downslope, and basically that means that, 
It's kind of the welder being able to automatically take itself from full welding power to no arc whatsoever, like when you're done welding. And it's not something we're going to be using with the foot pedal. I mean, in fact, yeah, it says right here, turn off down slope while using foot pedal. And so that's what we're going to do. Before I started filming this, I just set everything here <laughs> into the middle. I figured we'd talk about it a little bit. But uh, yeah, that's kind of a nice feature if you're using a hand control, because, you know, that's really just an on and off thing. But with a foot pedal, it's... It's kind of weird, so as mentioned, we're just going to turn that all the way down. And over here we have our pulse on and off switch, and pulse is basically, the way I'd describe that is the arc itself, the machine cycles the arc on and off and on and off and on and off, and it has its purposes, like for welding, for instance, thin stainless steel, it's really good at keeping heat input down, but some people use it to make really aesthetically pleasing welds. It's kind of a uh, kind of a little cheat if you're into that. We're not really going to be using that in this series though, so I'm just going to leave this set to off. Next door we've got our 2T, 4T control. We're going to be running a foot pedal, so I'll just leave that set to 2T. And here we have our polarity, I guess we can say, polarity switch. We got alternating current and direct current. If we were welding steel, stainless, titanium, whatever, I'd set it down here, but as mentioned, we're running AC and we want that cleaning action, so I'm going to leave that set to AC. Over here we've got high frequency start TIG, lift start TIG, and stick mode, because as mentioned it's also a stick welder. I'm going to set this to high frequency start because, well, as mentioned we're running aluminum. And the final knob on the right is just going to be our arc force control for stick welding, but, you know, we're not, we're obviously not really stick welding, so I'm not going to touch that. Alright, gas flow. Now as you know, TIG, well, I mean it stands for tungsten inert gas, so it's obviously a gas shielded process and this machine gives you the option to adjust how long the gas flows before the arc starts up and how long it flows once the arc has been turned off. Now I learned in school that for really critical stuff a general rule of thumb is one second for 10 amps so if you're welding something at 100 amps that's 10 seconds of post flow but for a lot of things that's just plain not necessary and it uses an insane amount of gas and so for what we're going to be doing I'm only going to give this probably like a two or three second pre-flow. In fact, that's probably even a little bit much. I'll set it about like that. And post-flow, I don't know, maybe five seconds. The thing with post-flow is, you know, on some metals, especially higher carbon steel, if it doesn't get enough post-flow, then the weld is exposed to the atmosphere before it's totally cool. I'll just adjust my tripod here. Yeah, the weld is exposed to the atmosphere before it's totally cool, and uh, that can cause some issues, but especially when you're just practicing, it's not really something to worry about, and it will save you a little bit on gas. Now, these blue knobs are all pulse settings, but as mentioned, we're not really going to be using the pulse, so we'll skip that. And we'll make it over here in these two yellow knobs, ladies and gentlemen, we will be using. Now the one on the left is, well that stands for Hertz, and then we have Frequency. And this is basically just how frequently the arc is going to switch between electrode positive and electrode negative. It's how fast it's going to alternate, let's say. And if you've got a lower frequency, this is kind of fun to play with, you know, if you've got someone else running the actually welding, you can come over and screw with the machine. When you have this, the, the arc is going to sound like and then it gets really high as the frequency increases. And basically, I'm going to say this is something that for your specific needs and what you're welding, you're just going to have to play with. A higher frequency is going to give you a much tighter, finer arc than a lower frequency. And the knob directly to the right of the frequency knob is going to be our balance knob. Now this is actually a really, really useful tool and I'm glad this welder has it. I mean, I guess a lot of inverters and even some transformer machines have this. But alternating current is going to alternate no matter what between electrode positive and electrode negative. But the thing is, you get to control with a nice balance control such as this. You get to decide how long it's electrode positive and how long it's electrode negative in each of those cycles. And when you have the machine set to electrode negative, you get a lot more penetration. And when you have it set to electrode positive, then the metal is negative because, you know, the metal is obviously grounded. So electrode positive means negative workpiece. And that's when you get that cathodic bombardment action. And this is really good if you can't get something as clean as you like or if you need a little bit more penetration. Now if I go ahead and turn this more to the electrode positive side of the dial, we're going to have a lot more cleaning action. So, you know, if I can't get something as clean as I like, then, you know, it's not going to penetrate as much because it's going to be spending more time on the electrode positive side of the, uh, the diagram. I wish I had a diagram here drawn out I could show you guys. But this is good because, well, as mentioned, you do get a little bit more cleaning action. But the thing is, if you use too much electrode positive, then the tungsten is going to ball more. Now, 
you know, that obviously means that instead of having a nice point on the tip of our electrode, I'll talk about more, I'll talk about this more once we cover this last control here, you're going to form a ball. Now, keep in mind that if you want a ball on the end of your electrode like some people do, an easy way to get that is to, you know, if you're welding here because you got clean aluminum like you should, if you want to ball your electrode, all you do is you turn this all the way up and then you hit the pedal and it's going to form a ball and once you have the ball the size you want it, then you, uh, then you just turn it back down. But what I like to use is use just enough cleaning action and otherwise keep it set over on the penetration side. So now that I've covered this and screwed up my settings, I'll set it back to where I had it before. It was running about 120 hertz and that was working really well and about 40% on the balance. Okay, so now that we have that covered, let's talk about tungstens. Now what kind of tungsten electrodes do you want to use when you're TIG welding aluminum? Well, that depends on a lot of things. Among them are personal preference and whether you're running an inverter based or a transformer based TIG machine. Now this machine, the PowerTIG 200DX, as mentioned, is IGBT inverter based. But if you're running something transformer based like a, uh, like a synchro wave for precision take, you might want to use a different electrode. Now I'm not really going to go into that too much in this video simply because I don't want to make it into just epic information overload for someone that's new to the TIG process. And that information's out there. If, if you want to research it, then, uh, then more power to you. It's nothing you can't find with a quick Google search. And I'm just going to go ahead and use the same electrodes I use for pretty much everything, these 2% thoriated tungstens. The next thing you got to figure out is how you want the tungsten to be prepared. Now, there's three different ways you can do this. You can have a pointed tungsten to use on steel, and that, as the name implies, simply means that the tungsten has been, well, sharpened to a nice, sharp, pointy point. Or you can have a bald tungsten, which means that you have a ball on the end of your tungsten, of course, that you generally don't want to exceed one and a half times the diameter of the electrode. And uh, so there's that, or you can do what I like to do, which is just a combination of the two of these things. Now it's worth noting that some people feel really, really strongly that no matter what, you need to ball the tungsten, or no matter what, nobody bothers to ball tungstens anymore, just sharpen it to a point and use it. I know a lot of people have their opinions on this, and what I recommend is that you simply experiment with all three types and decide what works best for you. Now it's also worth noting that the type of machine you're going to be using might play into your decision a little bit. Now there's a lot of folks out there that'll tell you with a transformer based machine you're going to want to ball the tungsten with an inverter like this one there's really no need to. But again it's just it's sort of a case by case basis and in my opinion personal preference is a large part of it. Now how do you ball the tungsten you ask? Well what I like to do and again everyone has their own way of doing this is I'm just going to reach over here to our balance knob and I'm going to max this thing out for maximum cleaning action. In fact, we're going to have so much electrode positive cleaning action that this electrode just can't get any cleaner and it's going to start to melt. Alright, it's not actually an issue of cleanliness, it's more electrode negative and electrode positive, but I don't want to take the fun out of it. And uh, anyway, once it's maxed out all the way over to the maximum cleaning action side, I'm going to stick it in my torch and we're going to fire up the machine and I'm just going to give this thing a lot of amperage and this point is going to turn into a ball. Now this is the way I'd recommend getting a tungsten that's partially pointed with a ball on the tip of it. However, if you just want a huge ball on the tip, you don't have to bother sharpening it to a point obviously. Just start with a blunt end and, uh, and just hit the pedal and it'll morph into a ball as well. <laughs> There's the bald electrode YouTube. As you can see, the ball itself is just over one electrode diameter. Now, it's important when you do this that it's absolutely, you know, perpendicular above the plate because otherwise it's going to ball to one side or another. And how exactly, what exactly it is that you use to ball the tungsten is entirely up to you. Now, when I went to school, we just had a big piece of, like, I think half inch thick aluminum, like scrap plate on our table, and that's what we were supposed to ball it with. When I went to high school, we just used the steel table, and I've heard other people say you always want to use like a penny or something made out of copper, but um, yeah, that's all up to you. I just generally use a scrap piece of whatever aluminum I'm working with, but that's just me. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's discuss filler metals. All right, now I have four different tubes here, and two of these are 4043, and the other two are 5356 types of filler metal. And my honest advice, if you're just getting into TIG welding and you know you're going to be doing some aluminum, is to get a couple different sizes of 4043 and a couple different sizes of 5356 because with those two grades of aluminum filler metal, you can weld pretty much anything. Not okay, within reason, you, I won't even say that. I'll say you can weld a lot of stuff with those two different types of filler metal. The thing is with aluminum, 
It's a little bit different than steel because with steel, you know, you can just spark test it and say to yourself, all right, this is low carbon, medium carbon, high carbon steel. I'll just use this electrode, this type of filling metal rather, depending on the process. Maybe this preheat and you weld it and it should be totally fine with a few notable exceptions. But aluminum is a lot trickier. Now when you're going to be repairing something, it's really, really important that you know what type or what grade of aluminum it is before you start the repair. And ideally, if it's been heat treated or not, Simply because of aforementioned reasons, I mean, it's, it's a little bit different than steel and filler metal composition is slightly pickier, generally speaking, of course. But if you're going to be repairing something and you don't know what grade it is, look around whatever it is that you're working on and see if it's been welded. If it hasn't been ripped, if it hasn't been welded rather, and it's only been riveted or bolted or screwed together or what have you, there's a good chance that it's non-weldable aluminum. Not every grade of aluminum is weldable, and if you weld non-weldable aluminum, it might hold, but it's probably just going to break as soon as there's any type of force applied to it whatsoever. So. You know, as mentioned, I really think it's imperative that you know what type of aluminum it is that you're working with if, you, if it's at all critical in any way, shape, or form. Now, if it's not critical and you're just making like a picture frame or something for your desk, 4043 and 5356. If it is critical and you find out what grade it is, there's a good chance you can weld that grade with 4043 or 5356. Now, I'm just going to throw this out here. The main difference between these two filler rods is that 4043 has a lot more silicone in it and it produces a weld that's a little bit more ductile and because of the higher silicone content it flows a little better and in my opinion it looks a little better than a 5356 weld. 5356 as you can tell because it's 50 something instead of 40 something is from a completely different family of aluminum and because of that it's not like 4043 in respect that it's a lot harder it wears better it's just, but it's also going to be a little bit more brittle and because there's not, not as much silicone in it it's not going to flow as nicely so that's just something else to keep in mind and the last thing we're going to talk about before we start laying down some metal is safety now, you know, TIG is a process that sometimes people like to skip out on safety gear with, and that's really not something you want to do, even more so than with some other welding processes, for two reasons. The first of which is that when you look at someone who's stick welding, MIG welding, or running flux core, or a number of other processes, and you see that bright light, you're not just seeing the arc. You know, with those processes, bits of filler metal fly across the arc from the tip of the electrode on their way to the weld puddle. So the arc itself and the light that comes from it is kind of diluted a little bit by that. And also because most processes other than TIG produce smoke, by the time the light reaches you, it's gone through a little bit of a smoke screen and it's not as harmful as the pure arc energy of TIG that shouldn't have much, if any, of a smoke screen. And the second reason is because of the high frequency ability of this and most other TIG machines. Now, as you may know, if you've got a patch of bare skin, like, you know, if I was going to weld in this t-shirt and I rest my arm on my grounded table, and, uh, you know, your bare skin contacts a grounded work surface, and you initiate high frequency. You know, if you're running DC TIG on steel or stainless, and you're just using high frequency start, or if you're TIG welding aluminum with continuous high frequency, whatever it is, if your bare skin is touching a grounded surface, there's a good chance you can give yourself a pretty serious jolt just from the high frequency. Now, I remember when I was in high school, this guy in my class, I think he was actually wearing a long sleeve shirt, but it was really hot and sweaty, so, you know, his shirt was soaked in sweat, and thus, when he leaned on the table, he was grounded. Well, this kid was petrified of electricity, and he hit the pedal and gave himself a nice high-frequency jolt, and he must have screamed for, like, three solid minutes. I felt really bad for him at the time, but... Hindsight being 2020, it's one of those memories from high school I'll probably never forget. So regardless, where I'm going with this is it's really important that you cover up when you're TIG welding. You know, I really love it here in Texas, but it's somewhere in the 90s right now, so it's a pretty cool day just for comparison. And uh, this is going to be a lot cooler to wear than like a heavy set of welding leathers. And also, since we're TIG welding and we don't really have to worry too much about sparks and spatter and whatnot, well, you can easily get away with a lighter welding jacket such as this. And now that we got that out of the way, I'll just put my helmet on. I'm going to set this at about between a shade 10 and 11 just for the relatively lower amperage stuff we'll be doing today. And I got my gloves here. Let's put these on real quick and fire up the welder. You're ready to go. Alright, now the first thing we're going to work on is getting used to holding the torch, running the foot pedal, starting the arc, holding the arc, and breaking the arc. And the way we're going to do that is with a pretty simple drill, which simply comprises of taking a clean piece of aluminum, setting it on your table, and then 
getting your torch ready to go. Now what I'm going to do is take this lead and put it across my lap just to take some of the weight off my wrist so I can be a little bit more steady. And then we're going to get ready to weld. I want there to be about a 90 degree angle between the axis of the torch and the table itself. So I can like that. If you're coming in at a weird angle like this, or a weird angle like that, and your bead's gonna be all jacked up, and it's gonna be favoring one side of the weld joint, I'll, I'll put it that way. And in terms of a push angle, you wanna use one, but not much of one. I wanna go probably about like such, maybe five or 10 degrees tops. I mean, you definitely don't wanna pull the puddle, but you don't wanna go into it like that or anything. So, once we're set up like such, I'm gonna get ready to use my filler rod. Now we're not actually gonna add filler metal quite yet, but I just want to show you guys how I like to hold this. And I like to form a 90 degree joint between the axis of the torch and the filler rod while I'm welding. So one more time, just to go over this real quick, we're 90 degrees between the axis of the torch and the table, like such, and we're running a very slight push angle. Okay, so this is the way you hold the torch when you're TIG welding aluminum. And I guess the very first thing we're gonna do is to just press down on the foot pedal, initiate the arc, get the arc going, and then we'll taper it back down very slowly until we feel like we can do this repetitively and without stabbing the plate with the tungsten or fumbling with the foot pedal, just, just until it feels natural and you feel like you're ready to go on to the next exercise. Let's try it out. So once you feel like you're getting the hang of this little put down the dots exercise without filler, I guess the very next thing to do is to try it with filler. Basically, I'm just going to take another piece of aluminum right here, and I've got my piece of 332nd inch 4043 filler, and what we're going to do now is pretty much the same exact thing except we're going to add filler metal this time. Previously, we just get a nice little puddle formed and then we'd end the weld. Well, this time, what we're going to do is get that small liquid puddle formed and then just add a little dab of filler metal just to get the hang of adding filler to a weld puddle. And then, as you can imagine, the next thing we're going to do is to start our puddle like we're going to do in this exercise and work our way down the joint with it and we'll be playing some inner beads. But for now, we're just going to get the hang of adding filler metal without touching it to the electrode like I do more than I'd like to admit. So let's see what that looks like. And so now, in between that exercise and the next one, I feel like it's time to talk about just a couple things real quick. Alright, first and foremost, we're going to talk about avoiding this little dimple right here. Now, I'm not sure entirely how visible this is going to be on camera, but basically, if you look real close, you can see there's a void in this crater, which could be a real problem, because I know this is kind of hypothetical right now, because this is just a little dot we put down on some scrap metal, but if this was on a real project, and this was the end of a weld, and this weld was ever put under a lot of stress, there's a good chance if it were to start cracking, it would start right here, right where this dimple is. So you just you don't really want to have this here and what causes this is if you could pretend this piece of filler metal is my tungsten And I'm holding it up here the arc is going to be going in the direction of the tungsten So it's going to be shooting straight down into the middle of that weld puddle And if I break the arc too fast and it just disappears Well, this metal is going to solidify without having a chance to fill in again because you know It's not really it's transitioning from its liquid state to its solid state and that happens before it can fill this little void and that's what you're left with. To visualize what causes this and how to avoid it, I've just gone ahead and set my foot pedal up on the table here. And so let's say my hand is my foot and I'm just welding away and I got the foot pedal set about there. I'm using almost all the current that I have available to me. And when I reach the end of the weld, I just go, but what happens when I do that is that the current disappears and it leaves that void and because there's no more current flowing into the molten well puddle, the puddle solidifies before it has a chance to fill that void. So the easy way to avoid this is instead of just going like that entirely too fast, you go from this 
you just taper off real slowly, like such, and you get bonus points for taking your tungsten electrode and moving it in little circular motions. And what this does is instead of leaving one deep void, you're going around and around and around. So instead of, instead of the arc going like straight down all the way through the weld puddle, it's not going as deep and thus it's easier to, it's, it leaves an easier void to fill. Now sometimes a teeny tiny, almost microscopic void is kind of unavoidable. <laughs> Void, unavoidable, see what I did there. But leaving a huge crater is definitely avoidable. And as mentioned, you know, if there's any stress applied to the weld later on down the road, there's a good chance that's where it's gonna start to crack. Now, just for right now, practicing on some scrap metal, it's not really something we have to worry about, but it's a really good habit to get into. And, you know, the best way to start a habit, a good habit at least, is to start it early on in your welding career. So I just thought I'd go ahead and share that with y'all. The next thing we're gonna talk about is feeding the filler rod. Now, there's not really a whole lot to feed since we're just adding one little dab of filler you can probably just lean in and go like that and be a-okay but you know once we actually start laying beads like what we're gonna do next that traverse several inches down the uh, the course of the joint you're gonna have to actually make a conscious effort to feed this wire and this is something that I recommend practicing with the welder off you know if you can take a piece of filler rod and just work on this while you're watching TV or whatever it'll it'll really work to your advantage but basically the way I'm holding this filler right now is just with those first two fingers and I've got it resting right here on my thumb and now, if I'm welding, I'd probably start out like this, and as I need filler, I'd feed it like such, and once this part of the filler is gone, I'd stop feeding it, I'd clamp down on it with my thumb, I'd release with the first two fingers, move up, clamp down, release the thumb, feed more. So it's just kind of a smooth motion, just like that, and as mentioned, if this is something you can practice in your free time when you're just starting TIG welding, then that's also really gonna work to your advantage. So basically what we're gonna do is the exercise we just did. However, after we add that first little dab of filler, instead of breaking the arc like we've been doing, what we're gonna do is move forward just a teeny little bit and add another drop of filler and another and another all the way down the joint. So, hopefully this progression is coming naturally to you. That's kind of, try that's kind of how I'm trying to lay this uh, course out. But anyway, let's try it out and see how it goes. Hopefully it goes better than that. When that happens, it's really best just to go ahead and switch out your tungsten real fast. It prevents a lot of potential issues and it's gonna weld a lot better for you too. And you know what, to be honest, even though it's kind of embarrassing when you do that, it's also kind of inevitable. So I'll just switch these out real quick and we'll be back in business. All right, now before we get started, I just wanna show you guys something. I was planning to use this piece of filler rod as my pointer, and that's when I saw that on the end of it there, it's a little bit balled up. As you can see, it's kind of balled up, and this is something that I used to really, really struggle with when I first started welding aluminum. And as you can see, it's an issue that once you think you have it beat, sometimes it crawls up and uh, shows up again, just real briefly. But the good news is that if you're like me and you used to struggle with this, or you still do, or whatever, it's generally pretty easy to work around, and I'll show you what causes it and how to avoid it. Now in my experience, the most common cause of this is simply not using the right angle with the torch. For instance, as you can see here, I'm demonstrating the 90 degree angle between the axis of the torch and the filler rod. And basically, if I had too big of an angle like that, what's gonna happen is, to put it really simply, heat shoots out of our torch, kind of. We'll just, just get work with me here. And it hits whatever it is that you're working with and it reflects off the surface and it comes forward to where your filler rod is and it melts the under your filler rod. So the easy way to avoid this is to simply quote unquote, point the heat downward some and try to keep that 90 degree angle between the axis of your torch and your filler rod. At the very least, simply use less of a push angle or reposition your filler rod. That seemed to fix it for me. 
All right, now let's have a look at these beads. Now this one here is the one I like best out of all the ones that I laid down. And what we're looking for is consistency, as you can see right here. And this is caused quite simply by just being consistent and rhythmic when you're adding your filler metal. Now this is something else that takes a little bit of getting used to, especially at first, but what I advise people to do is if you can do it safely, if you're like in a crowded weld shop or something, it's probably not a good idea. But if you're at home in your garage and you're just safely practicing your welding skills, you'll probably be okay. What I recommend doing is listening to some music and simply just adding filler metal with the beat of the song. And that way you get in a certain rhythm and it just, it helps to build your rhythmic filler metal adding skills which helps with the consistency of your welds. Now let's talk real briefly about amperage. So the thing is when you're TIG welding, especially with aluminum let's say, it can be kind of challenging sometimes to know exactly how much heat you're putting into the puddle simply because when you're, I don't know, stick welding, you know, you most commonly set the machine at the panel for let's say 120 amps and then you know you're working with 120 amps. However, when you're working with a foot pedal, you can't just glance over at the machine to see how many amps you're putting out, and because of that, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to determine the amperage that you're running at. So, my best advice, until you get a feel for how the puddle looks and handles and feels, is to simply look at the welds afterwards. Now this weld on the right is done with half the recommended amount of amperage. I know it's half because I set the machine at the panel and worked with that. And as you can see, this is a really cold looking weld. You can see on the side of the weld, it doesn't really smoothly form into the plate like this weld does, and this weld does, and this weld, which is too hot by the way, does. As you can see, it's just there's a sharp ridge where the plate meets the bead, and that's one of the refining characteristics of a cold weld. Likewise, this weld was done entirely too hot. As you can see, everything here definitely flowed together. I mean, we do have a pretty nice transition between base metal and the weld bead itself, and these ripples do flow into each other nicely. But the problem with this is this weld is huge. It's much wider than the welds over here that are done with the... Uh, you know, correct amperage as you can see, and it's really hard to control. And if you feel like you're just shoveling metal in there, then you might want to go up a filler rod size. But if you're using the right size filler and the puddle's just pulling everything out to the side entirely too easily, then you might be welding with too much amperage. So that's a little something on amperage. And now I guess the next thing for us to discuss is a little something on what I commonly refer to as the heat to metal equation. Now a good weld is what occurs when you balance primarily two main factors. There's other things like cleanliness of material, filler metal selection, proper gas if needed, etc. But for now we're just gonna focus on two main variables and that is the amount of heat and the amount of filler metal. Again, this is pretty much just something that you're going to have to get the feel for, but basically this cold weld was caused by adding too much metal to not enough heat. We've got this much metal, but we only have this much heat, and this much heat can't properly melt and fuse together this much metal, and that in a nutshell is how we get a cold weld. How do you avoid this, you ask? Well, there's two things you can do. You can go from this much heat to this much heat, or if you want to stick with the original smaller amount of heat, you need to minimize the amount of metal that you're putting into the weld and that way you have a proper amount of metal with a proper amount of heat. And a weld that's too hot is, you guessed it, the polar opposite. That's what happens when you take entirely too much heat and you add it to not nearly enough metal and then you have other problems such as undercut and excessive warpage and heat input and possibly some other issues as well. But where I'm going with this is what you're going to want to try to get a feel for is balancing the amount of heat and the amount of metal. Now if you're just welding along and the weld puddle feels too hot but you're pretty sure you're at the right amperage or maybe you've even tried to cool things off a little bit by going down a few amps but regardless that puddle still feels super hot and you're having heat related issues with your weld it might be because you're inadvertently adding too much heat to not enough metal and you ask yourself what can you do about this? Well, in that situation, I'd say that you're probably using too small of a filler metal because dipping normally, the smaller diameter wire just can't add the right amount of metal to the puddle. So as a result, you're running too hot, even though your amperage is set right. And the opposite of that would be if your puddle just feels entirely too cold, and no matter what you do, you can't get it to run right. Because there's always too much metal that's been added, and you just can't get things to flow right well then you might be using too large of a filler rod and because of that I recommend just going down a size. Now like I said in part one, if you're just getting started and you're working with eighth inch material like this, I recommend keeping some 332nd inch and some 1 8 inch filler rods around. 
But if you don't have the optimum size of filler rod, there's a couple things you can do. If you feel like you're adding too much metal to the puddle, you can work on making microscopic little dips and just melting off the teeny tiny tip of this filler rod. And likewise, if it feels like you're not adding enough metal, you can just feed this really quickly and shovel it in there. But again, as mentioned, if possible, you're going to want to use a different size filler rod. Something else to point out is that this is what it looks like when you dip your tungsten. Now, I know it kind of sucks to have to stop and change these things out all the time, but if you don't, what's going to happen is this black mess around here will sort of leave a trail down the weld, down the sides. As you can see, this was done with a tungsten that hadn't been dipped, and we have this plain white substance. Well, if I'd gone ahead and dipped that tungsten, then I'd have at least some of that darker material that follows the weld puddle and stays off to the side. It doesn't look nearly as good. And one thing I'll tell y'all is that even though you didn't hear this from me, this black mess is pretty easy to remove. You can remove it with a wire brush, or if you want your weld to stay nice and shiny, you can usually just take your glove and scrub it off of there or a scotch Bright pad or something along those lines would probably work as well. So this is removable, but again, if you dip your tungsten welding aluminum, it really is best to just switch it out. Now I know it totally sucks to go through like a million tungstens a day, but if you don't switch it out, then your welds could potentially have some issues, and even if you're just practicing, then it's not going to weld the same, the arc's not going to be as good a quality, and you know, again, it's really the best thing you can do is just stop and switch it. I know it's a pain, I know it kind of sucks, but it will get better, and you know, like I said, it happens to pretty much everyone. Okay, it happens to everyone that welds aluminum or really anything with TIG. To an extent, it's unavoidable, but like I said, with practice, it does get better. Alright YouTube, so at long last, it is time to finally start our very first weld joints. And I think the way to start off is with what's referred to as an outside corner joint. And this is formed by two pieces of material coming together at a 90 degree angle. Now there's a couple different ways you can set up an outside corner joint to weld. You can just take two pieces of material so you have something that'll sit flat on a table. Or alternatively, you can set up a four-sided figure such as this and position it on two two-sided figures like what we talked about earlier. Another idea would be to make one of these triangular figures and that way you have a flat position joint when the figure itself rests flat on the table. However, it's worth noting that since an outside corner joint is technically where two pieces meet at a 90 degree angle, this isn't technically an outside corner joint, but it's pretty similar and if you're just practicing, it's just something for you to keep in mind. Now why do I recommend starting off with outside corner joints, you ask? Well, plain and simple because you pretty much just have to work your way down that joint and melt the two sides and add a little bit of filler metal. You kind of have quote unquote boundaries set up by the edges of the plate. And in my opinion, a flat position outside corner joint is probably one of, if not the easiest ways to start putting, you know, joints together. All right, so let's get set up YouTube. Now as you can see, I'm facing a slight dilemma here. My torch naturally rests about an inch off the table, and our figure that we're going to be welding on is probably, I don't know, three inches above the table. So what I want to do is have it so my torch is where I want to deposit the weld, but naturally, so that way it won't be shaky and unsteady, and I'm less likely to dip the tungsten. So the way I'm going to do this is just to slide this up a little bit, and is this cool yet? Yeah, I'm just going to use a piece of scrap metal to rest my wrist on. And that way I'll be supported and I'll be a lot more stable than if I was just kind of hovering here. So now that we got that out of the way, I've got the torch lead in my lap to take some of the weight off my wrist. And I'm just going to work my way down the joint. Now again, we're positioned 90 degrees this way. I'm going to be using a slight push angle this way. So let's see what it's like, YouTube. Alright, so that YouTube is the finished product.
So ladies and gentlemen, what's next you ask? Well, lap joints. Lap joints, as the name implies, are formed by two pieces of material simply overlapping each other. And lap joints are, in my opinion, one of, if not the easiest types of joint configurations to weld out, so I figured this would be a good step up from the outside corner joint. Basically to weld this out, what we're going to do is get our puddle formed, and we want to watch this upper edge of our top plate, and we want this to be enveloped, and maybe we want the puddle to go in just a teeny tiny little bit further than that, but whatever we do, we don't want to have our puddle just here on this bottom plate, we certainly don't want it to come into like here. So with that being said, I guess there's really nothing to it but to do it. Behold, our lap joint. Now the cool thing about lap joints is it's a really good way to brush up on your skills simply because these are really easy to lay out and once you have them laid out they're really cheap to practice. What I mean by that is I could take another piece of plate like this and just lay it up under like such and uh, just have another partial joint and then add another plate and another plate and another plate and make this go on for as long as possible. Not only that, but sometimes you can get away with using pieces of aluminum that you've practiced earlier, like up here on the top. Now obviously I wouldn't want to set this like that because then we'd have this epic gap down here. Here we're going to go from welding the inside of the corner to welding the outside of the corner. What changes here, you ask? Well, a number of things. First and foremost, instead of welding these exposed edges, which, as you can see, are clearly exposed and thus don't require as much amperage to weld, we're going to be melting basically the sides of this plate to an eighth inch 4043 filler. Also worth noting is the fact that since we now have to dig down into the joint, so to speak, I'm going to go ahead and increase the stick out of the electrode just to make that a little bit easier. All right, now, once again, I'm just going to let this lead rest in my lap. I'm going to make sure I'm in position to comfortably complete the length of the entire weld joint so this way I'm not banging into stuff or having to resituate myself while I'm trying not to dip the tungsten. And again, I'm about 90 degrees this direction, and I'm going to be using the same slight push angle that we've used all along. So on that note, I'll just take a deep breath here, get rid of the weld, and inside corner joint. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, there's the finished product, everybody. Now, I'm not going to say there's a secret to running inside corner joints or fillet welds, but I will say that if there was, it would probably be that you really have to try to focus on going right down the middle of the joint and most importantly, making sure the puddle is spread evenly between the two sides. You definitely don't want to favor one side over the other. And the other piece of advice I could give is not to get ahead of the puddle. You know, it does take, in my opinion, a little bit longer to weld, at least it feels like it takes longer to me to make your way down the joint just because you're kind of waiting on this puddle to tie into two sides as opposed to two edges. 
and uh, you don't really want to hurry the process. That's something I always used to do, but I guess that's about all I can really add about outside corner joints. And the other thing is, to me, it at least feels like it takes a little bit longer to weld an inside corner joint than, you know, maybe an outside corner joint or some other configurations just because you're melting two sides and you're waiting for the puddle to tie into two sides as opposed to two exposed edges and you can't really hurry the process. You have to be kind of patient, you have to wait for it, and you have to let the weld progress at its, at its own pace, so to speak. You, uh, you definitely don't want to just floor the pedal and, and hurry it. Now I will say that fillet welds are quite a bit like their inside corner brethren, but there is one notable difference, and that is that instead of welding two edges, you know, you're welding the inside of the edge, but you're still kind of welding the edge of a plate. You're only welding one edge, and you're welding basically down the middle of another plate, and that is a little bit trickier heat input wise, because this is going to take slightly less heat to melt than this, so you kind of have to balance that out. So now I'm going to go ahead and position this joint, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to hold it straight out in front of me like this, and I'm going to rotate it probably about 30 degrees or so. I'm going to lay it down on the table ahead of me, and this way I can just sort of work my way down the joint at relatively natural compression. Now as you'll notice, this is considered a horizontal fillet well, whereas if it was flat, it would actually be like this. A lot of people have the misconception that a flat joint is one that's like flat on the table, but as mentioned, this is actually horizontal. In order to get a fillet welder into the true flat position, you have to do something to rotate it like with up these, you know, corner joints we welded out earlier somehow or something along those lines. But we're not going to do this because I feel like, you know, we welded everything, almost everything in the flat position so far, and I feel like now it's time to pick it up a notch and try something in the horizontal. So on that note, let's begin. So yeah, there's our finished product everybody. And the last thing I want to talk about in this series is going to be vertical out of position TIG welding. Now as I mentioned before, the gas tungsten arc welding process isn't nearly as position sensitive as say stick welding or flux core or something along those lines. But that being said, you can't exactly turn gravity off so this is still something that we're going to have to contend with. As you can see, I've gone ahead and tacked and or fully welded together a bunch of plates from various courses in the day. You know, here's our that exercise we did just starting off, and uh, there's where I may or may not have dipped it. <laughs> here's where I've balled the tungsten a few times. But anyway, what I have here is a vertical fillet weld, all brushed up, cleaned up, and ready to go. Now first and foremost, we're still going to want to go ahead and aim for the middle of the joint like we're doing here. We don't want to come in at an angle because then we'll end up favoring one side over another. But to help compensate for the pull of gravity, instead of using the, I don't know, 5 or 10 or maybe 15 degree push angle that we usually use, I'm just going to go ahead and bump that up a notch. And this is going to work to help guide the puddle to where we need it to go instead of sagging down with the pull of gravity. And the next thing we need to discuss is how you hold the torch when you're welding vertically with the TIG process. This really just comes down to personal preference among other things. You can hold the torch vertically like such if you so choose, but what I like to do is to turn the torch between 90 and 180 degrees just depending upon the joint and the project and how hard it is to get to aforementioned weld joint. So for this, I'm probably going to be, I don't know, probably about like that or so. Also worth noting is that there's a pretty good chance you're going to end up being fill rod from the bottom of the joint. And on that note, I guess this is about the part where the series winds down and comes to a close. So as always, YouTube, thanks for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more. I really hope this series will get you off on the right foot if you want to learn to weld aluminum. 
And much like with anything welding related, or with any number of other things in life, you get out of it what you put into it, and practice makes perfect.